This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. We tend to hear a lot of people telling others how to live their lives, emphasizing the need for personal responsibility. In this week's episode, we'll move across 2,000 years of history to see some of the origins of that discussion of personal responsibility and its cost today. The philosopher Seneca is the original source of much of our dialogue around being self-made and pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps. But it turns out he was born into wealth and privilege. The University of Pennsylvania's Emily Wilson explores that in her book, The Greatest Empire, A Life of Seneca. And then, among those whom our society regards as taking the least personal responsibility are drug addicts, who are frequently treated like criminals. Journalist Johan Hari gives some reasons why they shouldn't be, in Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs. But first, here's my interview with Emily Wilson. So what is The Greatest Empire, and how do we conquer it? <laughs> yes, so the, 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 the title is based on a pun which I think is really important in Seneca's work and in Seneca's life. The, what he says is that the greatest empire is to be emperor over oneself. Um, so he's looking within his philosophical writings and within his Stoic philosophy for having um, control or empire over his own um, irrational desires, over irrational emotions, over impulses towards consumerism, bad kinds of habits, um, and instead having complete control by being a good person, a virtuous person. So that's one kind of control that he wants, one kind of empire. But then, of course, the other kind of empire is the kind of empire that the Emperor Nero had, and that he's trying to get, he was also, in being political advisor to Nero, speechwriter to Nero, PR person for Nero, he wanted that kind of empire as well. Interestingly, the, the Senecan philosophy uh, is, is very popular in modern times, mm -hmm. and I think for a lot of the same reasons that it might be uh, that it might have been then, which is to say when you have an opportunity to, to have a lot of what you want, mm -hmm. what then is left for you uh, to, to, to figure out? Mm -hmm. The question that lurks in Seneca's work is, what is it that you really want? What is really, really going to be happiness? What is, what is it truly to be a king? What is it really to be powerful? And on some level, really being powerful means the good, the good life and not actually bothering about material wealth. But on another level, really being powerful means exactly what you think it means. It means being the richest man in Rome. And all of this is done where, while he's talking again about the greatest empire being the empire of oneself, while he is at the right hand, at, at worst, I guess, of, of the emperor, mm -hmm. uh, while he's the emperor's tutor, the emperor's uh, council, and has presumably the ability to shift policy at least mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm but generally doesn't in a way that would be beneficial to the masses, mm -hmm. is, is generally selfish. It's selfish. I mean, people have discussed whether or not um, in the early years of Nero's empire, the, it's called the first, the first five years, the, the five-year rule. Um, it's sometimes been said that those years of Nero's rule were much better than, than later. So it's possible that while Seneca had more direct influence over what Nero was doing, maybe he was able to moderate what he did to some extent or other. I'm actually somewhat skeptical about that because I think there were, there were certain really bad things that Nero was doing right away and Seneca didn't seem to have either to have any ability to stop him, but also it's, there's no evidence that he even wanted to stop him. I mean, such as the fact that Nero, almost as soon as he came to, the, came to power, murdered his stepbrother. And Seneca then puts a nice spin on it and suggests that, in fact, Nero is not a bad murdering kind of emperor, but no, he's a lovely but merciful kind of emperor. And Seneca wrote this whole treatise about mercy and made Nero the primary example of the merciful person who doesn't spill blood unnecessarily. This is not a murderer. And now, Johann Hari on the war on drugs. At, at core, a lot of what you're trying to explore um, in, in opening up the war on drugs to a, to a different kind of examination is, is just what happens when we have some empathy for people? Four years ago when I started working on this book, you know, I had a very personal reason to want to look into it. We'd had a lot of addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories was of trying to wake up one of my relatives and, and not being able to, and as I got older, realizing why. And when I, I also realized, when I was thinking about that, which I've been thinking about all my life, and I realized we were coming up to 100 years since drugs were first banned, and I thought of myself as a pretty well-informed person, but it kind of started to occur to me that there were loads of really basic questions that I didn't know the answer to about the drug war, you know. Why did we go to war against drug addicts and drug users in the first place a century ago? Why do we continue? What, what are the alternatives? And what really causes drug use and drug addiction? And it really struck me, 
I didn't want to understand those questions in an abstract way. I didn't want to sit in my room like I was at a philosophy seminar and write about that. I wanted to know how it affects real people in the real world. So I just went on this journey. I didn't realize what a long journey it would be. I ended up going across nine countries and 30,000 miles. But I wanted to just sit with people. I wanted to know, you know, what is it like to be a drug dealer? You know, so I sat with a transsexual crack dealer in Brownsville, Brooklyn for a long time. What is it like to be a homeless street addict in Vancouver who starts an uprising that changes the country? What is it like to be in a country where all drugs have been decriminalized? And so what happened in some places where they uh, decided to deal with drugs on a different basis, to deal with addiction on a different basis when they said, all right, maybe some of the science is worth looking at. I went to the countries that have moved beyond the war on drugs. The one that was most striking to me, there were several, but the one that was most striking was Portugal. In the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is mind blowing. And every year they tried the American way more and more. They arrested more people, they rounded up more people, they put more people in prison and every year the problem got worse. So one day, the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together and said, look, we can't go on like this. And they decided to set up a scientific panel of doctors and judges to figure out, look, you tell us what would genuinely work and we'll agree in advance that we'll do whatever you recommend. So the panel goes away, comes back about a year later, and it said, decriminalize everything from cannabis to crack, but, and this is the crucial second stage, take all the money we currently spend on punishing and isolating addicts and spend all of that on reconnecting the addicts with society. Right, and that gets to something because there's one thing, there's one aspect of what you're getting at, which is understand what addicts are going through and that they're, they're, they're uh, missing a lot in life and they're not violent criminals and treating them like violent criminals is not going to, not going to generate uh, the kinds of results you want. Punishing people who are kind of punishing themselves is not going to, is not going to achieve great returns. But at the same time, one could say, one could make the argument, well, but maybe we have fewer addicts than we would because we're, because we're making it so hard to get to addiction. We're making it so hard to get your first uh, uh, sample, get your second sample, get your third sample. It's illegal, it's hard to find, it's expensive, and so on and so forth. Maybe that's achieving something, but you're saying it's not. What we have at the moment, the drug war, is anarchy. Unknown criminals sell unknown chemicals to unknown users all in the dark, right? That's why you have chaos on the streets, you have violence, it's controlled by armed criminal gangs. Legalization is actually a way of restoring order to this chaotic and anarchic thing. So what they do is, if you're a heroin addict in Switzerland, you go to your doctor, you'll be referred to a clinic, and you can go to a clinic and you can get heroin there. You can't take it out with you, but they'll give it to you and you can use it there. And what's very striking is the addicts get their lives together, they, they, you know, they, um, they get jobs, they get homes, and although they can stay on that program as long as they want, there's no pressure to cut back, the vast majority of them do cut back over time. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast, available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast and the on-demand menu on Cable Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.